who is surely one of the most extraordinary and distinguished scientists uh, in the United States. Um, he will be uh, talking and answering questions uh, about the current coronavirus pandemic. And he'll be introduced by Columbia faculty and Institute fellow Emlyn Hughes. And so I'll leave it to Emlyn to introduce Dick. But let me just briefly say about Emlyn <clears throat> that he's professor of physics at Columbia University and the founding director of the K equals one project, the Center for Nuclear Studies, which as some of you will know is part of his completely extraordinary pedagogic work, particularly with undergraduates. He's the author of uh, uh, over 800 refereed publications. I would have thought that number impossible until I met Emlyn, uh, and now I'm, I, I know that it's completely possible. Um, and his research into the uh, lo long run effects of nuclear uh, tests um, took him this year to French Polynesia. And if you're interested to see uh, the first fruits of that, you can see a video that he put together that's on the CAE section of our website. So the protocol, please, would be that uh, if we could ask everybody to put their computers on mute and switch off their video, uh, there will be a talk uh, by Dick, followed by a question and answer session. And if you'd like to ask a question, please put your hand up um, uh, using the using participant site of Zoom. Uh, and we will field questions. And if, you're, uh, if you ask a question, please remember to unmute and put your video back on. Uh, and the whole thing will last between an hour and a quarter and an hour and a half. Thank you very, very much for joining us. And I'm going to hand over now to Emily Hughes. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I had the honor and privilege of introducing Dick Garwin for this uh, presentation today. Um, this, it's obviously a relevant topic um, that we've chosen, and it's also the topic that killed our nuclear communication workshop that was going to happen a week from now in Paris. Um, so we're, we're going to be talking about that. Um, so I could easily spend an hour or hours going through all the accomplishments that uh, Dick Garwin has um, achieved in, 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 in his work. Um, so, but I'd rather than do that, much of it is technical and much of it is physics. I'm going to do something a little bit, since it's a broad audience, a little bit different. Um, I'm going to try to put Dick's work in perspective of um, sort of the world of physics. So in the 20th century, the most famous physicist was Einstein, and everybody knows that. And, um, but he was a theoretical physicist. And probably the most famous um, experimentalist physicist in the 20th century was Enrico Fermi, who is an Italian physicist, very involved in the, in the development of the atom bomb and so on. Um, and Dick was actually one of his students. And Fermi, I think I sent a video to um, some of the fellows about a film that was made about Garwin. And Fermi basically referred to Dick as the one true genius that he's known in his life. Now, I'm going to be really not modest now for a few minutes, so humor me. Um, in the world of physics, you can create a family tree. And that family tree, or world of science, or the world of academics, in which um, your father or mother is who your thesis advisor is. And then you can go back in time with that. So my thesis advisor is a physicist named Jack Steinberger. Um, who is who I did my research with in Geneva, Switzerland at the CERN laboratory. And, and it turns out that Steinberger was also a student of Fermi's. So I, my biggest bragging in life is that my grandfather was Enrico Fermi. I never met him. And of course, Dick's father was Enrico Fermi. So that makes Dick my uncle. And I just realized that kind of last night. Okay, so that is the tie between, that's one of the ties between the two of us. Um, okay, so the first thing I want to say that everyone's going to understand in some of the inventions that Dick has been involved in, um, some of you probably have cell phones, and some of those cell phones probably have touch screens. Dick Garwin was the inventor of the touch screen, so that um, is probably 
you probably aren't thinking about who did what when you have a, a, a phone or so on. He also, um, for those who are older, um, you may remember the days where there was a printer and it sort of was just a fast typewriter. So it was kind of like a line printer. Um, Dick was also the inventor of the laser printer, which um, again, you just take it for granted today how quickly printers are, but um, Dick was also on that project. So those are two, two of the things that he has um, contributed sort of to, to everyday life. Um, there are many, 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 many things that he's done in physics and in all different fields of physics. I've, I'm even doing research now that has to do with imaging and magnetic resonance imaging. And J Dick just, and, and I worked with a professor who, who came from the early days of Columbia and is now at Princeton. Turned out Dick had done that research already too. So it's, it's like he's just all over, it's pervasive, um, his presence. Um, what I, however, want to, focus on a little bit right now is Dick has had a major role in the world in terms of science and science policy. And that's obviously what's also bringing this talk forward today. He was on essentially every um, nuclear arms negotiation committee between the United States and the Soviet Union or, or Russia. And his work for basically every president um, worked on committees and so on for every president on the nuclear weapons topic um, since you know, since the beginning of the Cold War, since the Cold War and discussions of, of what was happening with proliferation. Um, he wrote a book, I'll just say that I talked about in my, I gave a talk at the Institute in the fall, and I very much referenced the book that was written by him and um, George Sharpak. Sharpak was a Nobel Prize um, physicist from France. They wrote a book together on nuclear weapons and nuclear power. And that's the book that I use when I'm teaching undergraduates about this topic. Um, so he's been very deeply involved in science policy and the interaction with governments on, on these issues. Um, a follow-up book to the one that was written in English was um, Dick and Sharpak upgraded their book and, and made it for, and wrote it in French. And they did it also with, um, um, Bernard Journet, who I think is also on this phone call. I don't see all the names, but I think I glanced that she's, she's participating. Um, so they wrote a book in France that's a modern ver that that's more up to date. And I very much want that translated into English, but uh, they did, but it's not yet translated. And I know that they, they had some struggles with the publisher. Um, but this is sort of the key textbook on nuclear weapons and nuclear power, if you're learning like from a freshman level or for the for kind of the outside world. So it's been a very important document for the K-1 project. It's kind of our, our Bible textbook um, that we, we teach young people. Um, one last thing, um, since we are talking about the coronavirus today, or Dick will be talking about the coronavirus, um, he has been involved broadly, not just nuclear weapons, in many government policy issues. Um, a number of years ago, I think this might have been the first public talk that I heard Dick give directly. He gave a colloquium at Columbia on the oil spill in the golf course during the Obama administration. He was pulled in as an advisor to work on that project. And he came to Columbia and gave a whole talk on, on, on um, dealing with that crisis. So, Dick has been involved in government and crises for also many, many years. So he has a very you know, deep view of all that. And um, last thing I should mention, um, he did win the Presidential Medal of Honor from Obama um, during, I think, the, the latter years of, of the administration, or maybe it was the last year. Um, and so, look, he's been recognized. There's, I'm, I'm sure I've probably done five percent of what he's accomplished but i shouldn't spend hours um going through all this and so i think i'm just gonna hand over um hand over the the talk to dick who has prepared a little discussion on the topic that is on everybody's mind all the time now so thank you so much dick for for doing this for us okay thanks Emlyn. so <clears throat> I have questions and answers about the current coronavirus pandemic, and I circulated it. So I hope some people have read it and are ready with questions. The uh, Columbia professor of physics who had 
uh, Emlyn's apartment, I. I. Robbie, when he was a kid in uh, the early 1900s in New York City, was always asked by his mother when he came home from school, did you ask any good questions? So I hope you ask good questions. So uh, here we go. And I have put here uh, the Garwin archive there. And you can search it without even going there. I won't go into detail now. So the current pandemic disease, uh, COVID-19, is caused by a coronavirus similar to that of the SARS epidemic of 2002-03. The current virus is named SARS-CoV-2. And there are many facets to the discussion that I can't talk about. Many people all over the world have spent their entire careers on these uh, different aspects. There's the spread of the epidemic. I will talk about that. Understandable in terms of simple models that give valuable insight. And then there is the detail of the virus and how it infects the body once it contacts with the mucous membrane, such as the eyes, nose, or mouth. Then there are consequences of the infection, the destruction of lung tissue, or problems of an active immune system, cytokine storm that kills otherwise quite healthy people and was probably responsible for the death, many of the deaths in the 100-year-ago Spanish flu epidemic. And here's a graphic of, uh, of daily deaths in the United States from, from uh, this coronavirus compared with other leading causes of death. And uh, I can call it up, I hope. Let's see, I've got to stop this thing. Ignore that. So down here, you see uh, COVID-19, there were 11 uh, deaths that day, the March 18th, and then March 22, and up through April 7th. And uh, April 7th, the COVID-19 killed 1,900 people in the United States the first day it uh, killed more people than heart disease. And uh, of course, now it's, it's more, probably 2,700, and it will uh, outpace everything else. You can exercise this yourself. Uh, I've got to find my presentation again. Then there are the uh, potential responses to the virus to prevent the consequences of its unimpeded spread. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. I wish I had somebody here to hang up the phone. With most of the people infected and on the order of one or two percent of them dying. Uh, with most of the deaths among older people for whom the death rate for an infected person over 80 is likely to be 10 to 20 percent, even with the relatively good care that could be provided in the very small epidemic in Wuhan and the corresponding province of Hubei, China. I've been in, in Wuhan twice, but decades ago. So I provide here, I thought uh, how I should present this and to uh, present a detail of the current uh, situation you know, is what I think you should know, but that's not what I want to do. I want to tell you what my position was just a month ago and the information that I sent around so you can see where this started and where we have come. So on March 8th, I circulated this item one to scores of colleagues as fighting COVID-19 in words of one syllable, so to speak. Uh, and please note that the things in square brackets uh, were in the original document as additional information. And the things in curly brackets uh, are added uh, for this presentation. COVID-19 is a matter of life and death for many American families, including yours. 
those of you who are Americans, and it's a matter of life and death for the rest of you too. You're likely to lose a parent or grandparent in your immediate family unless we are able to affect the behavior of the vast majority of people in the United States. I was writing for a United States audience. Uh, then there are the, so, uh, let's see. And actually I have a long and but not deep background in analyzing and writing about serious pandemics. For instance, the next flu pandemic, what to do until the vaccine arrives. Uh, uh, and you can click on that and see the actual paper published in Science Magazine. It's just a one page report of the conference that we organized. Under normal societal interactions, a communicable disease is characterized by its reproductive factor, R0, and incubation interval I, usually in days, as a result with an assumed number of index cases in uh, N naught, the number of cases increases exponentially by a factor R naught every I days. Without intervention, it stops when the effective R naught falls below one because there are insufficient unexposed people left to propagate the exponential growth. Roughly this happens when only one over R naught of the population has not been infected, whether the infection is lethal or not. So with an R naught of three, which was uh, supposed uh, for the uh, current coronavirus up to a few days ago, uh, two thirds of the people would be infected before the uh, epidemic stopped. So uh, for physicists or engineers, imagine a fission reactor without energy release, it would stop when sufficient depletion of the fissionable mass uh, occurred. And other ways uh, by which the epidemic uh, subsides is with effective vaccine or with antiviral medication taken uh, prophylactically, either after sickness, which is not prophylactic, or in a continuous prophylactic dose for instance, for healthcare workers, if such existed for this particular coronavirus, which it doesn't that we know of. Interventions such as social distancing aims to reduce R0 to a lower value R, even at uh, reduction to R equal two from an assumed R0 equal three can flatten the curve and ultimately reduce the population infected from two thirds to one half. And still, you know, uh, one or two percent of those will die. But reducing to R equal 0.5 is a totally different kettle of fish. It can provide essentially perfect protection if done soon enough. At that point, there might be 100,000 index cases, people with the coronavirus. And if R0 could be reduced to 0.5, the total ultimately infected would be only 200,000 total, which is less than one-tenth percent of the U.S. population. China forced families to stay in their apartments except for one member every two days in the lockdown in Wuhan and Hubei. Uh, and that person could go out for two hours to buy food and other essentials. It's important to understand that R0 differs greatly among subpopulations in dormitories versus single family homes and so on. With its vast surveillance and enforcement teams, China may well be, this was a month ago, able to resume normal life with R equal three uh, while quant qu uh, quarantining new COVID-19 cases. And that's exactly what they are doing. China seems essentially to have achieved this low infection level in Hubei uh, province outside of Wuhan, uh, but how low China can ma maintain R as people return from New Year uh, from, from their villages to resume industrial and commercial and educational and sporting activities remains to be seen. I've pointed to many, uh, pointers to many URLs in China, mostly in Chinese, as to how many uh, have returned to work. Uh, I have a Chinese friend, a physicist retired from Brookhaven, who keeps me posted. Back to the US problem. There's no threat where there's no virus. It's really important to understand how long the COVID-19 virus survives on various surfaces, the extent to which it spreads by droplets from sneezing and coughs, 
or coughing or by aerosol from normal exhalation by infected people or by fomites uh, from picking up virus uh, from surfaces such as doorknobs, push button, handholds, or railings in public places. We need uh, as a society to learn from best practices elsewhere and also from bad practices such as those in Iran hiding the presence of COVID-19 cases. As for procedures for personal protection, here is what I am doing and what can be done by most in the United States. And so I described a bought and reused blue nitrile uh, gloves, extra large in my case, and so on. But I've sent you actually the detailed uh, and current document. And I reuse them first by washing the gloved hands in weak bleach as uh, promulgated by the Center for S Disease Control, 100 to 1 further dilution of 5% liquid hypochlorite laundry bleach. And so it's 0.05% hypochlorite. I add a little bit of dishwashing, dishwasher, de dishwashing detergent, sink detergent, Dawn, or other kitchen detergent, so that it's a good washing liquid and wets the gloves or hands. And uh, then, so that's the end of what I circulated on the 8th of March. And then I sent this to other people, and it was not about individuals, it was about uh, the country's response. So I referred to the item one, the attached email sent the previous in evening is oriented toward personal protective measures against COVID-19. The ease and cost of several of these depend on the outcome of several simple tests that should have been done years ago and can be done in days now. One I did in my kitchen and others in any bio lab uh, capable of handling COVID-19 to determine its lifetime on various surfaces uh, at elevated temperatures, its vulnerability to solutions uh, of common kitchen detergents such as liquid Dawn or lifetime in the 0.05% solution of liquid laundry bleach, uh, diluted 100 to 1 uh, mild bleach solution. And the data are now available and you can see them uh, in this article in Lancet Microbe but I, I'll show it to you later under questioning. From the US national point of view, though, the most important guidance would be first to use best practices from other countries such as Singapore and South Korea for outdoor testing so that teams of agents can provide drive-by testing or walk-by testing, photographing a person's face and identity card together with the barcode number on the swabbed sample container. Uh, sorry. And second, learn and assess the best practices in minimizing infection. And third, but the most important, is to recognize that without a vaccine for a year or an effective, affordable antiviral drug, two million Americans are likely to die. That's 1% of 200 million infected, compared with the 35,000 annual average from seasonal flu. And no matter how assiduously protective measures are practiced by an individual, her or his infection can be delayed but not prevented, specifically reducing an R0 equal 3 to R equal 0.5 by a factor 6 for one individual will delay a person's infection by the time required for the epidemic to grow by a factor six, about three weeks or so. But if we could all reduce R equal to 0.5 at some time, that is reduce our contact with other people by a factor six, the total number of people infected in the country would only double from that point and the epidemic would end. That's what happened in Wuhan. Few people understand this essential point, which means that your health and the survival of your parents and grandparents depends on providing almost everybody else in the country with the tools and interest in social distancing and personal protection. So they protect themselves, they protect you. Of course, we need to find and test vaccines and antivirals 
and we need to learn soonest about the mutation rate of this RNA virus. Uh, it, it mutates, but so far hasn't mutated in the parts that uh, are used for the preparation of most of the vaccine candidates. So the impact of the intervention, intervention can be shown by an SIR model, the susceptible population, the infected population, the recovered population, or if, they, if not recovered, died. Uh, for instance, this New York Times uh, March 13 article by Nick Kristoff and, uh, and Thompson. So, so uh, anyhow, I'll show you this. Okay. It should, should, it should come up, but it's recalcitrant. Okay. So here is the article itself from the New York Times, and uh, here's additional intervention begins. So if it uh, had begun at the end of March, 3.1 million people in the United States would be infected at the peak in July or August, and 300,000 people would die. We don't have that much intervention yet. If there were no intervention under these assumptions, 9 million people would be infected at the peak, and here would be a couple of months of peak infection, so that about 200 million people would be uh, infected altogether, and 1 million people would die. So you can uh, play with this yourself. Uh, at least I hope you can. Some places you can. Anyhow, it's possible to slide that uh, that yellow bar back, and it's possible also to change the degree of uh, there it goes. The d the degree of uh, and h here are some other aspects. So. Here, 100 million total infected, another portrayal. And the ICU cases at peak are 366,000. And uh, there are 95,000 ICU beds. So that's the real problem at the moment. And the other problem is that an ICU does not solve the problem for the person who gets into it uh, because a substantial fraction of them die. And uh, which is unfortunate. So here is uh, just a compilation of uh, the draft. Uh, this is a compilation of the state. Uh, in, in the United States, the current reported cases per million. So the highest in, is in New York State, and they're almost 1%, 10,000 cases per million, probably by today, since this uh, last date here was April 8th, yesterday. Just about 1% are known to be infected, but there's a delay in reporting, probably by about, about a week. And the doubling time, this next number here, is, uh, is nine days. It used to be three days in New York, down here, where the curve is steeper. And of course, Here's when the, there was the first number of cases, 10 cases, or 10 uh, reported cases per million population. And it was March 6th or so in Washington state, especially in a nursing home. And other uh, states began later, and they've been sol following suit. But here is when uh, social distance, distancing started, and it it's caused a level, leveling off, and we hope it causes more. So here was this 8,600 new cases in Washington for this last day. Here, 14,000, I'm sorry, total all in, 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 in the state. Here are 8,000 cases in Washington state, 142,000 cases reported in New York state and climbing. 
So that's uh, all I have to say at the moment, and I'll be glad to answer questions. Okay, um, I think the next thing is people should just um, raise their hand by hitting the raise hand button. Um, and then I'll, I'll just go down the list as, as it comes up. Um, okay, Mark, do you want to start? Go ahead. Thank you very much, Dick. Um, I have a question about the usefulness of the um, case statistics. Uh, or put another way, which of these statistics do you think more or less reliable? I mean, it seems to me, being a total layman, that our estimates of the number of cases at any point in time are as much a function of whether testing was ramped up or not as they are of anything else. Um, and that the statistics on, for instance, the number of deaths, although that those two will be problematic for various reasons, might be more reliable. I'd be grateful for your for your thoughts on on the statistics that we've been given and how to read them. Well, statistics on deaths are better. On the other hand, uh, a lot of people die at home, and more will die at home, and uh, those have not been. In, included in many cases. So the number of deaths uh, due to COVID-19 is larger than has been reported, uh, but we'll straighten that out, unfortunately. And the, the number of, of, of cases is not just from testing though, but people who go to hospital and have uh, distinctive symptoms are uh, certainly are very uh, reliably categorized as COVID-19 because uh, it is, it's not a rare thing that could be confused, confused with other illnesses at the moment. Its presentation is quite different from normal seasonal influenza. Thank you. Um, Bill, go ahead. Hello. I found that um, quite fascinating. I'm wondering whether, are you, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Okay. I'm wondering yep. whether uh, what you see reading the newspapers and so on uh, indicates that there is sufficient social distancing in the United States at the moment to reduce uh, uh, the transmission factor. Well, we don't know. <laughs> Uh, it would have been good had this modeling gone on. Uh, we've been very deficient worldwide in the support of public health. I remember 30 or 40 years ago, a, an acquaintance from Columbia uh, was going to uh, Harvard to head the School of Public Health at Harvard. And I made uh, occasion to meet with him in, or, in order to plead for more work on uh, epidemics and things like that. But the uh, federal government and most governments uh, very bad in the United States because of political differences in the past anyhow, have uh, been reluctant to fund public health. The United States does not have a uh, government responsibility for the most part. It's uh, in the state and local, so it's all fragmented compared with many other countries. So uh, we don't know. And uh, there should be experiments, monitoring of people by, by tracking their cell phones and things like that, uh, which some of which is done, but not by the government for this purpose. Now, if I could just- And, 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 and you, need, you need also uh, to ask uh, what the uh, transmission uh, mechanism is. So until a week ago or so, it was, you know, the conclusion of experts, but experts are people who deal with other diseases. Nobody's an expert on COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And uh, that the uh, transmission was by fomites, 
or by droplets uh, from sneezes and coughs. And that's the origin of the two meter distance rule. Uh, but uh, then uh, evidence began to accumulate actually some measurements of the RNA from the virus in hospitals where people who were asymptomatic but had tested positive, uh, you know, were just occupying uh, rooms uh, and, but they weren't sneezing or, or coughing, um, but they were probably talking. And uh, the, you can look up from a couple of years ago uh, to see the number of, uh, of, uh, of particles in so-called, uh, sorry, uh, so there are droplets and there are aerosol. Aerosol suspensions are those that are essentially permanent where the uh, foreign particles don't fall because they're suspended by the molecular uh, bombardment by Brownian motion uh, of the air molecules. And so we've had measurements now for the lifetime of the uh, virus in aerosol form. And it's uh, a good many hours so that if you are in a confined space, uh, then the aerosol population builds up as uh, people continue to breathe and speak and the air is recirculated. So just in the last day, the CDC, Center for Disease Control, has advocated that employers uh, increase the uh, rate of change of air in rooms. Typically, the requirement in the past has been only one air change per hour or two air changes per hour. And now it would be better if it were higher. As that's one of the things that we uh, discussed in our op-ed in uh, 2011 in the Washington Post, that is collective protection against uh, communicable disease. Thank you. Rolf, you wanna ask? Yes, hi, hi Bill. Uh, thank you very much for um, this uh, really helpful presentation. Um, my question uh, has to do with the effectiveness of ventilators. Um, I know there's been a little bit of controversy recently about um, whether the ventilators are also uh, contributing to some of the lung damage that we're seeing in some of the patients. Um, I know, so I have a cousin in Paris who, who was infected with COVID and um, she spent almost um, 25 days on a ventilator and um, she's still on it. And it, it's, it's been really hard to take her off the ventilator. And, um, and so I'm just wondering um, if you've looked into the question of ventilators and, and to what extent, um, you know, one can, can, can I guess some doctors are wondering if the procedures around using ventilators at their max strength isn't damaging the alveoli, um, alveoli. Um, I don't know if you looked into this question. No, I know a lot about um, ventilators and people who make new designs of ventilators and things like that. But uh, for people with advanced uh, respiratory support, the odds of getting, of surviving uh, being on the ventilator uh, are only about 30%, maybe even less. I've seen reports from emergency room uh, physicians in a New York hospital. There are detailed reports from people in Wuhan, from uh, uh, physicians in Wuhan. So I don't think it's the ventilator, but I don't know. I'm not a physician. I have no experience myself. It's uh, probably the progress of the disease, which is specifically a disease of uh, lung cells that it affects many other cells in the body. For instance, one of the early uh, symptoms is a loss of uh, sense of smell and taste because it affects the, the cells in the, in the, in the uh, pharynx and uh, nasal region, which are devoted to uh, reporting uh, molecules for smell and taste. So uh, personally, I'm not going to go to a hospital if I get this disease, but uh, that's my personal choice. Hmm. Thank you. Benoit, do you have a question? 
Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Gawain, for the, the presentation. My question had to do with the two meter distancing rule that you just mentioned. I was curious about how the threshold for the adequate distance, the adequate distance is set because, in, so I'm talking from France. And in France, we were first said, we were first told to stay one meter away and now it's 1.5 and you say two. So I'm curious about how this threshold is decided. Well, in the United States, it's two. <laughs> but uh, you, can, you can look at how long it takes a sizable droplet from a sneeze or a cough uh, to fall by gravity through still air. And uh, two meters is pretty safe. On the other hand, uh, if you cough, <laughs> you get a, uh, a vortex ring, which really uh, projects many meters and carries the uh, content, the, the droplets to that distance. And uh, as I say, now we know that in addition to uh, coughing and, and sneezing, uh, the uh, virus can be spread also by aerosols uh, from normal breathing, but especially from speaking. And uh, that has not really been evaluated yet. Now, there really, you know, before you know, there has to be more research. And uh, don't be even two meters away if you can help it from somebody who is coughing or sneezing. And don't be in spaces where there are many other people who might have the virus. Of course, if you are a family that is isolating itself and has been for two weeks, you don't need to worry about uh, uh, interpersonal uh, 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 contagion because nobody has the virus. But if somebody in the family does have, then you have to take extreme measures to uh, isolate as much as possible. Dick, um, I'm going to read you a question from um, sure. Pauchi, who's one of the fellows who can't can't be on audio and video, but she sent in a, a question. So let me just read it so everyone um, has it. Um, Taking into account the aggressive outbreak the virus has had in a first world country like the US, do you have an idea how this pandemic will impact emerging countries in Latin America and in Africa? What would you suggest to these governments? Which policies would you suggest them to implement and for how long do you calculate these policies have to be followed? So it's all, that's a lot of questions, but yeah, it's about emergent countries. Well, it will be, you know, disastrous for many countries. Okay. Um, and uh, every country has, you know, experts in epidemiology, and they should uh, rely also on the, uh, the World Health Organization. I have a friend with whom I've worked for 20 years, uh, you know, isolating with his wife in the south of France <laughs> now. And he's uh, 20 years younger than I am, but that he's still 70 plus. And uh, that makes him at very high risk. So he's not going to be deployed by WHO to handle this outbreak in uh, lesser developed countries the way he was last year to handle outbreaks of other diseases. So uh, local people and consortia and the WHO you know, have to be involved. They could read what, I, what I've written, uh, but I, I have really very little understanding of those countries or of their systems. Emma, you wanna ask your question? Hi, my question was about how long does one shed the virus after they've been infected and also the reports of people recovering and then getting reinfected and I was wondering um, why well, I, I haven't seen reports of people recovering and being reinfected, mm -hmm. uh, but with such large numbers of, of people, there may be uh, and we don't know. The uh, standard in the United States, I believe, is two days uh, without elevated temperature and without symptoms. The, then people can be discharged. 
and uh, and are likely to have immunity, but it's really unknown whether even uh, light cases uh, have sufficient immunity to prevent reinfection. But what you do know is that uh, with the people from uh, Wuhan and um, more generally Hubei, there have been no uh, emergences, that is community transmission of the virus uh, since the end of the lockdown. So there are no continual virus shedders because so-called herd immunity has certainly not been achieved in Hubei and could only be have been achieved in Wuhan, which is a city of 11 million, uh, if there were 100 uh, silent cases for every one that was recognized. And uh, that's where a lot of the random surveillance is lacking and uh, deficient in the United States. We should be using some of these scarce tests in the United States to determine what has been the incidence of the virus. Uh, there is the uh, reverse transcriptase uh, PCR test to look for the viral RNA, uh, the nucleic acids that are particular, st strings that are particular to this virus. But then there are antibody tests, which are just emerging and are uh, not uh, widely available uh, that determine whether you have antibodies to the virus. And we need those to see how many people have been infected. But no, it's, it's not a big problem. Uh, if that were the only problem, uh, we could handle it very well. And I've long advocated for six weeks or so that we use these precious people, the ones who have recovered 80% of the cases are, have light sim symptoms. And uh, my neighbor, for instance, uh, self-isolated for two weeks, uh, didn't have to go to the hospital. Uh, I haven't spoken to her, I've communicated with her by email, but uh, you know, she's perfectly well. And so a lot of those people could uh, serve very important functions by working in uh, COVID-19 wards as uh, people, as helpers, as cleaners, and so on, office people. And there will be more and more of these. It takes a while, though. There is a very interesting article from Los Alamos uh, published just in the last three days. And um, I'll call it up in a minute, which shows the delays involved uh, in Wuhan, at least, <clears throat> in uh, infection and going to the hospital and recovering. And, uh, <clears throat> and but uh, this this population of recovered people should be should be prized and exploited. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to have Marie ask her question, and then I have two questions to read from outside. But Marie, go ahead first. I have a question about asymptomatic cases, because from what I understand, in places where they've tested a lot, they found um, that there, there's a very high level of asymptomatic cases. So, so how does that fit in, in the whole equation? And also, uh, a very dumb question, but how can you transmit it if you're asymptomatic? Yeah, well, if you could tell me what the, quote, very high level is, that would be helpful. So there are many asymptomatic cases, uh, but uh, whether it's 30% or three times the number of symptomatic cases makes all the difference in the world. And I really hate the edit editors. I don't hate editors, but I think that the editors of newspapers could do a much better job if they put in more numbers, despite, you know, the publisher of, uh, of the book, A Brief History of Time, suggesting that the uh, sales of the book would, would decrease by a factor two for every equation that was in it. So not equations necessarily, but numbers. So you can't tell from that statement. And if the asymptomatic cases were a hundred times the symptomatic cases, uh, then there would be herd immunity by now in Hubei, but there were a lot fewer actual cases and deaths in, in, in Wuhan, but there were a lot fewer actual cases and deaths in uh, Hubei. 
which is uh, a province of 57 million people. And so there is certainly no herd immunity in Hubei or in the rest of China. So uh, it, it, it could have an epidemic again if uh, the, the uh, virus took hold rather than being stopped by isolation of people who have symptoms or who may have come from regions like the United States where the epidemic is still raging and gone back to China in many cases. And they're required now at their own expense to be put up in a hotel. And, you know, it's a very, very nice hotels, but uh, whether, where they could either develop uh, COVID-19 or not. And if not, then after two weeks, they're allowed to move freely around China. So without uh, symptoms, as I mentioned, the main transmission would either be by uh, uh, imperfect hygiene, you know, people who rub their eyes and whatever and then touch solid things, or people who speak the way I'm speaking, and uh, a lot of uh, viral particles come out as aerosol, and they waft around forever until the air is changed and they go out with the change of air, but they're replaced by more uh, viral particles from these asymptomatic uh, COVID-19 uh, infectees, infectors, anyhow, people who have it. Okay, Dick, I'm gonna read you a question from Catherine Ewing, who's one of the fellows. Why are disinfected gloves better than simply hand washing? Oh, uh, because you can take them off, for instance, and you can uh, sanitize them perfectly. So here, just a moment. So here are gloves that I've been wearing for two weeks, really, when I go out. I wore them full time in the house for a week until my daughter uh, chastised me for not believing in the germ theory of, uh, of disease. And I, I chose these in the beginning because I could get them at the store, uh, not a medical supply store, but a tool store that sells things. So these are nitrile gloves. They happen to be blue. You can get them in all, all, all uh, colors. And uh, they probably come from China. They cost $7 for a packet of 100 gloves. And uh, so when I uh, pick up the newspaper or I go shopping, I go outside, I wear my gloves. I come in, I wash my hands in the weak bleach uh, together with a little bit of detergent. And, you know, uh, it's a lot easier to wash gloves than it is, gloved hands, than it is to wash ordinary hands. A, you don't need to worry about the, even the weak bleach affecting the skin, but it's pro uh, proposed by WHO and CDC uh, for hand washing during the Ebola epidemic. Uh, but you don't need to continue to wash your gloves. Once you have them wet with the uh, solution and you just think great thoughts for 20 seconds while the uh, solution is on them, then you rinse them off and uh, you're clean. And then you, know, you might worry, maybe you got something on the cuff of the glove. Well, you can you take the gloves off either by pulling the fingers or very often I take the glove off simply by pulling it at the cuff and it turns inside out. And I don't blow it to put it on again until I put it in the oven at, you know, I think 60 centigrade, uh, which has reliably uh, been shown reliably to kill the virus, kill uh, the virus. So uh, that's what I do. And then even if you are in a region where there's a high viral load, you know, uh, washing the gloves in the weak bleach takes care of that. And uh, 
baking it at night uh, so you can reuse it the next day uh, uh, preserves your stock of gloves. Was there another part to the question? No, um, that was it. Um, also, if you have a, obviously, if you have a cut on your hand, that would obviously increase the chance of it getting inside. So like in the bloodstream, I suppose that's, I'm not sure that's a big effect or not, but. No, no. There's, a, there's, a, there's another question from, I think it's Dina, who's another fellow, um, Dina Nayari, and it's, um, what about plasma donations by people who have recovered or infected asymptotic is is there plasma effect is the plasma actually effective or is the studies insufficient so basically people who've recovered um and doing plasma donations is that you know uh, it's, it's being collected in in new york and has been elsewhere this is a very old uh, treatment for disease and um, presumably will work okay so that's but you know, it's, the the number of recovered is is lagging by uh, a month or so uh, from the number uh, who are infected. So it maybe it's it's not known how many people can be treated with the plasma from a recovered person. Um, I have a question that I'm just coming from me, Emlyn, um, and it's partially um, motivated by the fact that New York, Paris, and my daughters in Belgrade have very different rules on this. Um, obviously, we all know about the social distancing, but what about rules on runners? Um, Paris has just implemented sort of a halftime rule of not having runners during the day. Belgrade has pretty much shut down any runner. They get stopped by the police. And I think in New York, people are still totally running. So is uh, there's the aerosol issue of the virus remaining in the air for maybe an hour. So what, I mean, you have to develop policies on different activities. So should runners be restricted or not? I guess that's the question. Well, close runners, you know, you shouldn't run with a, a uh, an unrelated partner, one that you don't live with. Right. In, in close contact. But um, no, the, the outside is really very good compared with inside spaces. And uh, there's a lot of dilution and there's, there's sun, there's ultraviolet, which does a good job as well. So I, I don't know enough about that. Okay, but it's, I see. So that, that may be over, going overboard possibly? Yeah. Oh, one other question, let me just ask. Um, I heard a talk on using extreme ultraviolet, since you just mentioned it, um, like in installing yeah, 200 UBC, nanometer UBC. Yeah, in, in like airports and so on. Like ultraviolet is obviously dangerous for human health, but if it's very high wavelength, very short wavelengths, um, so it doesn't penetrate the skin, but might destroy the virus. Um, what, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Now, you know, I've commented on that to people who yeah. proposed it. And, uh, you know, it, it only uh, affects what it can illuminate. And so people have proposed ultraviolet for sterilizing uh, N95 masks. So I have an N95 mask, which was uh, 15 or 18 years ago, I bought 40 of them for friends and family and other N95 masks and distributed them. But the actual virus filtration of such a thing happens in an electrostatic layer in the interior of the mask. And the ultraviolet doesn't get there. It doesn't penetrate the outer plastic. And it's shadowed as well. And uh, on a handrail, it doesn't penetrate under the handrail because only the top of the handrail. So no, I don't think it's a, a good approach at all. Oh, interesting. OK. Yep. Um, and uh, irradiation, people have proposed reuse of masks by uh, gamma irradiation or E-beam irradiation. But yeah. that really destroys the function of the mask. <laughs> yeah. And so that, that wouldn't be a good thing to do. But light baking is good. <laughs> right. 
So can you light bake the N95 masks? I have it. This is my only one. I've given the rest of them away, so I'm not going to risk this one. Uh, right. But I, I've read uh, people say, say you can, but uh, mostly for ordinary people, you don't need to clean your mask. For people who work in hospitals with COVID-19 patients, they surely have a lot of uh, virus on the mask. And uh, in these, uh, in these uh, uh, detailed data, which I will try to call up in a moment, uh, published April 2nd in uh, The Lancet, I guess, shows the lifetime in various layers of the mask for the virus. <laughs> oh, wow. So uh, let's see, your question was, can you, can you bake the mask? Well, yeah. I, I haven't done mine, but yes, you can. And uh, I've spent a lot of time encouraging people in the last few weeks to do these experiments. Okay. I mean, how do you, how do you test whether it's effective or not? So you, you, obviously you can bake it and know that you haven't completely mechanically destroyed the mask, but how do you well, make the judge? Yeah. Well, you can test whether the mask still works in, um, in catching the small submicron particles. It catches right. them because in the interior, there is a so-called uh, melt-blown um, layer of plastic, kind of wispy plas plastic, non-woven uh, fabric, which is compressed. And uh, here, here's something I was going to uh, make a, an ex expedient mask out of. It's from my vacuum cleaner. And if this, this is labeled allergen filtration. And if you look on the inside, in, in addition to the sturdy layer in, that, in the vacuum cleaner that holds back the dirt and keeps it from coming out again into the air, there is this very, very thin, oh, it's up here. There's this very thin tissue-like layer of also non-woven stuff that catches micron-sized particles. But submicron viral size is caught by the electrostatic behavior of the uh, melt-blown fabric in the interior of the N95 mask. And it's that that's destroyed by uh, radiation and other things. Bad treatment. Yep. Um, I have a question for my wife, and I better ask it, or I'll be in real trouble. Um, so New York City has been particularly hard hit. What additional measures would you suggest to city and state officials? I think Governor Cuomo is doing a great job. He's, he's uh, rational, he, 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 honest. He, he gives a briefing every day. I've seen a couple of them uh, on television. And he's doing an excellent job. So okay. Stick with it. <laughs> Follow Governor Cuomo's <laughs> recommendations. OK. Um, are there other questions? Um, let's see. Oh, oh, here, here, Boucher has one. Um, so why, okay, Boucher, um, is one of the fellows. Why the, from, okay, why does the virus provoke a large variety of symptoms from muscle aches to skin rash? Why is there such a wide variety of symptoms, basically? Yeah. I don't know. And that's very interesting because uh, it may be where it mostly infects. And how that's determined, I don't know. I, you know uh, so if it infects the lungs, that's truly bad news because it spreads very readily in the lungs and you need the lungs for everything else. And in fact, I've even conjectured that uh, it might be possible to infect intentionally a portion of the body, like a toe or a lymph gland or something like that. Uh, see, some parts of the body are worse for infection, and so there must be parts of the body that are better for the person for infection. And you know, there's been nothing published about what that is because the infection is normally uh, through you know, mucous membrane or inhalation. 
but if there were such a, a, a place and the immune system could have, you know, 12 hours of uh, advanced lead over the normal route of infection, this might make a, a lot of difference. But the, the scientific and the uh, medical professions are absolutely against such a, a thought. And they are against the thought of a variolation, which uh, has been used in the past, uh, which is to infect people intentionally with a small dose. So it's thought also that large doses of virus uh, can overwhelm the immune system. There's some native nonspecific uh, immune activity, I understand, um, can overwhelm that modest protection and may give a more severe um, uh, infection. So uh, I don't know. That's a very interesting point and these differences are very important for research uh, to understand because if we understood the differences, we might be able to exploit them. Yep. Um, Mark, you have a question? You're next. Sure. Um, I want to, 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 to ask a kind of vaguely historian's kind of question of you, Dick. I mean, you've had a ringside seat at a science policy and public response to, to scientific developments at the highest level for more than half a century. And I think it would be, I, I would like to know what your thoughts are about how, well, let's start with American society as a whole has handled this. I'm not just talking about the policy angle. How, what has the social response been and how has it compared with the way American society responded to other major crises that you've seen o over the last half century. Can you give us some kind of perspective on this, a personal perspective on this? Well, I've seen it much, much better in the past, you know, ranging from, you know, I was personally involved in the Korean War, in the Vietnam War, and uh, in many other of the crises, as uh, Emlyn mentioned, the, uh, the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, the uh, Fukushima uh, nuclear meltdowns in, in uh, Japan in 2011, and so on. And uh, this administration uh, does not believe in, in government and has been doing its best to uh, disable and uh, the government. This goes back uh, to the Reagan administration. And uh, when people uh, wanted to reduce the size of government, reduce the role of government, and uh, you know, a lot of, they have, I think they truly believe that there exists a deep state, uh, which is against uh, the American people and with that uh, conviction, you know, you don't take these things seriously and you don't believe that government has a role. But with all of the social distancing and the lack of production, you know, we will have, uh, very likely to have a, a depression uh, rivaling that of the 1930s or worse. And the difference between this and most uh, disasters is that it's not localized in any way. So even in China, with the epidemic in Wuhan and Hubei, the rest of China proceeded essentially normally. And that's what's always the case in the United States if we plan for the explosion of a nuclear weapon in some city, uh, which has been the more likely thing over the last decades than all out nuclear war, then the rest of the country uh, could come to the aid of uh, the afflicted area. That's not the case here. Everybody is going to suffer and uh, so on. So, no, it's been uh, outstandingly dif different <laughs> and uh, worse. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Thomas, you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you for uh, your presentation. Um, I have a question which is um, both history and uh, future related. 
Because, um, well, the point of reference for this uh, epidemic is usually the Spanish influenza, and the second wave of the Spanish influenza has been the hardest and the most, uh, uh, the one with the most casualties. And I was wondering if it's possible to foresee, or how can we know if there will be, or if there could be a second wave of the coronavirus? Well, there surely will be if one stops the social distancing and other measures uh, before uh, most of the cases are eliminated. And we, we need to look at China because China has stopped the epidemic. There are a few, mostly not one case per day in uh, Wuhan anymore. Wuhan is open. I would be happy to go to Wuhan under <laughs> under these circumstances, <laughs> safer place than, than New York. Uh, but uh, we'll see how they do it. But you need to get it down to the point where you, you can uh, detect and treat individ and, and isolate individual new cases and all of the people with whom they've been in touch. And uh, there are apps on cell phones uh, that can help countries do that. So I've, I've called up uh, one of these things that's listed in the report. So here's the stability of SARS-CoV-2, this virus at different environmental conditions. So it's killed in one minute. So at 70 degrees centigrade, not killed in one minute, but undetectable in five minutes. And so th that's what I, what I do, except I measure in Fahrenheit. And if you want to have a milder bake because the N95 mask might, I don't know, probably would, but might not survive 70, but could survive 56, then you see that 30 minutes uh, at 56 centigrade make it undetectable. But at room, at body temperature, it survives for a day, but in two days, you know, outside the body, <laughs> outside the body, it doesn't survive. And here on surfaces, on paper, uh, it's undetectable after three hours. And, and uh, in wood, undetectable after two days. On cloth, undetectable after two days. But on glass, it's undetectable after four days. On money, on banknotes, probably American, I don't know what kind of banknotes these were. It takes four days, stainless steel, seven days. And here's the mask. I don't know which mask. So the inner layer, uh, it takes a week to expire at room temperature. And uh, the outer layer, it takes more than a week. So you can find all this stuff now on the web, which you could not, even though it was critical. And so here's the household bleach. My, my recommendations diluted one to a hundred and undetectable after five minutes. And here in various uh, acid solutions, doesn't do anything to it. And I've got to get back and talk with some people who uh, said that vinegar would take care of it, but I have to check with them and see whether I misunderstood. Um, okay. Are there any more questions? Um, I mean, Dick has answered a lot of questions today. <laughs> so, so um, this, this is what I showed you here, oh. in this, uh, this Lancet article, oh. and you, you can find it yourself that way. Great. Um, if, if there are no more questions, um, I want to very much thank Dick for um, answering all the questions and making this presentation. It's just wonderful to have a, a this perspective on what we're all going through right now um is dick do you have any last remarks or <laughs> besides stay safe <laughs> um, yeah. but, no thank you for the opportunity yeah it worked, worked really well from my point of view yeah no this was wonderful we, i mean thank you so much for doing doing this um, Mark did want me to remind that there will be a uh, talk next week, um, and it's actually, we're tapping into Benoit's world. Um, Hebataha is going to discuss 
and the title is Atomic Apocalypse, Utopic and Dystopic Imaginations in Arab Science Fiction. So it's, um, that'll be, it's a, a bit of a change compared to uh, the coronavirus. And, um, but again, I want to thank you so much, Dick, for doing this for us. And, uh, you know, we'll, we're probably going to bother you with more questions later offline. So don't, don't be surprised. Right. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay. Bye-bye everybody.